Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, back to that passage that we read just a few moments ago. As we pointed out, this text related to the flies is a good deal longer than most of the rest of the plagues as we find them given to us in the book of Exodus. We'll also see this morning that this particular plague of flies is mentioned multiple other times in the scripture. And there's a reason for that, I think, and I hope that we'll be able to see that as we go through it together. So we're in Exodus chapter 8, verses 20 through 32. A great deal more material is in this passage than what we were able to cover last week. Now, I think it is significant to note that in these 13 verses given to the plague of flies, we have not only some lessons for Pharaoh, but we also have some lessons for the children of Israel. And this particular plague is going to be mentioned in several other Old Testament prophets as a warning for Israel, as well as what it was supposed to be teaching Pharaoh at that time. But the Lord willing, will get to that in a few moments. You recall that last week we gave you a few different facts dealing with flies, 240,000 different kinds of flies, that's almost a quarter of a million different kinds, and only 120,000 of those have been fully described scientifically. So when God chose flies, he had a very large spectrum for which to choose. We also pointed out that the word flies is in italics in your Bible as you look at every one of the references there in that passage. Uh, it's what the translators understood based on their understanding of the word for swarms. So there is something that were swarms, and as we saw, something that was dangerous in swarms that affected both men and animals. It wasn't merely irritating, but it was also dangerous. We saw that the root word from which swarms comes, arov, means to braid or intermix or meddle or mingle. It's the word that's used for, in modern Hebrew for the mosquito, which is a biting and sucking insect. But it's not only used for mosquitoes in the Bible. We find it is used of all biting and sucking insects and describes what they do when they penetrate the skin to inject the fluid and extract the blood. We also saw that this word is used for a mixture of various kinds of swarming insects. As you read the text, it says diverse kinds of flies. It wasn't just one kind of fly that God sent to plague the Egyptians, but the text specifically says it was a diverse kinds of flies. We also noticed that there was a connection with dung beetles or scarab beetles, which was one of the gods of Egypt. In fact, you find in ancient Egyptian carvings many scarab beetles all over the land of Egypt. We also noted that these swarms were supernatural and not merely a matter of breeding on the dead frogs and the dead fish. We pointed that out because <clears throat> the flies did not affect the land of Goshen where the Jews were living. The entire Nile was full of dead fish. The dead frogs were all over the land, including Goshen. But the plague of flies, God specifically, he says, for this reason, I'm going to keep the land, the land of Goshen fly free so that you'll know that I'm the Lord, your God. Now, flies are quite mobile. Flies fly every place. If flies smell something dead or the off cast of some animal, that's where they go. They're very sensitive and they can perceive where that is. So they certainly would have flown into the land of Goshen as well. But God said, I'm going to put like a glass wall. Imagine that, a glass wall around the land of Goshen. You can see through it. But if a fly tries to fly, there goes boing, like it hits against the window. You know, there are not going to be even one fly in the land of Goshen. So it's a supernatural event. It's not merely a matter of flies breeding off of the carcasses of the frogs. We're going to see something else, too. Even if there had been flies breeding on the frogs, they couldn't have appeared as quickly as they did. But I'm saving that for a few moments from now. You'll learn about the larval stage of the particular types of flies that were involved in this. And these things are happening day after day after day after day. There was nowhere near enough time for those flies to breed off of the dead frogs and the dead fish. But the Jews were excluded. Not merely the air was filled with flies, but it also says the ground. It will be full of swarms of flies, that's in italics, and also the ground whereon they are. And so that's what brought us into the 
business of the scarab beetles, and we saw that Paul pointed out that in the pagan worship of men, they've not only worshipped men, one another, as many cultures have done, where they worship their emperor, but also they worship animals, they worship birds, they worship four-footed beasts, and creeping things, according to Romans chapter 123. They were back worshiping bugs. We also saw in the context that our Lord Jesus Christ spoke about this issue of the flies because he spoke about the Lord of the flies, Beelzebub. We read first out of the Old Testament in 2 Kings 2 where flies were considered a god by various ancient cultures, specifically part of the Philistine city of Ekron, where they worshiped Beelzebub, the Lord of the flies, Baal Zvuvim. Baal is Lord and Zvuvim, that's, uh, you can hear the sound Zvu, that's like a fly makes, that's Lord of the Flies, Baal Zvuvim, Beelzebub. And we found in all three of the Synoptic Gospels that the Pharisees challenged the Lord Jesus Christ and said that the reason he was able to cast out demons was because he was empowered by the Prince of Demons. And so, since the Prince of Demons is over those lesser demons, he could cast those lesser demons out. And our Lord Jesus Christ made it quite clear, and he shot down their argument by saying, well, if Satan did that, then he'd be destroying his own kingdom. And obviously, he's not in the business of trying to destroy his own kingdom. Jesus identified Beelzebub as Satan. And you know, this is 850 years after that passage in 2 Kings chapter 2. So Beelzebub was still known and well-known among the Jews, 850 years after that first occurrence where we find the Lord of the Flies in 2 Kings chapter 2 with Ahaziah, king of Israel, who tried to inquire from Beelzebub, and God cursed him to die through Elijah the prophet. In other words, the penalty for worshiping false gods is death. In the context, we also saw there in Matthew and Mark and Luke, we saw that they were demanding a sign from heaven like God had provided manna through Moses in the wilderness. And so, in that passage even, the New Testament is connecting the Lord of the Flies back to the Exodus narrative. And in that passage there, in the Gospels, recorded three times in the Synoptics, we saw that it's taking us back to the Ten Plagues and the contest between God and the demonic gods of Egypt. And it was what's still going on with the Pharisees. There's a contest between the true God and the demonic gods of the heathen. And Jesus wins. We then tied the full circle back together and showed that the Lord of the Flies is still well known in modern times. He's not disappeared from history. We saw that the 1963 film Lord of the Flies, which was also remade in 1990s, covers the same theology and the same power of Satan to control even good people. Those who are reasonable, remember there were two groups of boys that were stranded on that desert island, and those who are religious, those are the choir boys whose plane came down and they were all these young boys between 7 and 16 years old who were stranded on that island and yet Beelzebub got in control of all of them. The key issue in the Jesus versus Beelzebub narrative in all three of the Synoptic Gospels was that it gives us the specific definition of the unpardonable sin and that's very important, very important saying that Jesus performed the miracles that he performed in the power of the devil is what constitutes the unpardonable sin. The sin of unbelief is not unpardonable. It may be unpardoned at any particular point, but it's not unpardonable because we all started out in unbelief. And people who have been non-believers have trusted Christ and gotten saved. That's the only way you can get saved. So it's not unpardonable, it's simply unpardoned until a person trusts in Christ, at which case it is pardoned. In the specific context related to Beelzebub, the Lord of the Flies, God gave that definition of the unpardonable sin. Mark 3.22, the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub, and by the prince of devils he casts out devils. And then skipping down to verse 28, Verily I say unto you, all sins not some, all sins, including the sin of unbelief, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men and blasphemies, doesn't matter what you blaspheme, wheresoever with they shall blaspheme, but he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, 
but is in danger of eternal damnation. Now he gives you the definition of blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Here is the definition of blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, verse 30. Because they said, he, that is Jesus, hath an unclean spirit. That's Mark's description of the unpardonable sin. That's Mark's description of the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Every other kind of sin can be forgiven, but not blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Remember verse 31 of Matthew 12? All manner of sins and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And then we summarize the key elements in the unpardonable sin. The Pharisees were present. They saw Jesus himself perform the miracle. It was clearly supernatural. They could not deny that it was supernatural. There are only two supernatural sources that could have performed the miracle, God or the devil. To save face with the crowd, to retain their control and authority, they had to deny the power and authority of Jesus. See, he was a threat to their authority. They had to deny that power, which was the power of the Holy Spirit working in Jesus. They chose the wrong answer on that true-false test. And as a result, they damned themselves to hell. A pretty serious matter. Since Jesus is not here today, you cannot commit the unpardonable sin because you can't see him doing miracles and then say, oh, that miracle that he did there, that was in the power of the devil. That's what they did. The charismatics try to make you, you know, kowtow to their phony superstitions. And they say that you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit when you say that they're wholly laughing and they're wholly barking and they're smacking people on their foreheads and slaying them in the spirit and knocking them over with people behind them to catch them, all those other weird miracles, so-called, that they do, uh, if you tell them, look, that's not the way the Holy Spirit works, you don't find anything like that in the New Testament. They'll say, you just blasphemed the Holy Spirit. No, you didn't. You didn't blaspheme the Holy Spirit. You looked at it and you said, either this is in the flesh or this is a charlatan at work trying to control people so he can get money, or we got some demonism going on here. Those are the possible sources. Jesus is not involved. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is saying that the spirit that was in Christ was the spirit of Beelzebub. That is, and Jesus equates Beelzebub with Satan. And of course, we don't do that. So back to the flies. It's essential that we understand the connection that Jesus made between Satan and Beelzebub, the Lord of the Flies. We began to discuss the dangerous nature and danger that can be done by biting and blood-sucking flies when we ran out of time last week. Swarming insects, including the varieties that bite of flies, are vectors for malaria, dengue fever, West Nile virus, yellow fever, encephalitis, and other infectious diseases. They are the vector for the growth of pathogenetic biological agents, viruses, viroids, prions, microorganisms, bacteria, roundworms that live inside the body, pinworms, fungi, and other parasites. Sand flies in particular, we talked about them a bit last week, are a biting fly that's found in the Middle East. They carry a disease called, and I practice this so I hope I get it right today, Leishmaniasis, also known as spiking fever, which is common in North Africa and especially in Egypt. Leishmaniasis produces skin ulcers, including ulcers of the mouth and nose, and an enlargement of the spleen and liver. It's a result of protozoan parasites carried by those flies. And on Earth today, there are 12 million people currently inflected with Leishmaniasis in 98 countries around the world. Biting flies also produce other, several other fever viruses that we didn't discuss. Papatachi fever and Chandipravirus, which is primarily in India, a cousin that is a deadly cousin of rabies. I close by reading you an article from the Boston edition of the Epoch Times, April 9th through 15th, just a couple of weeks ago, 2015, page A1. The headlines reading, ISIS terrorists attacked by flesh-eating skin bacteria due to lack of doctors. And it was an article about that same disease, Leishmaniasis. The same flesh-eating parasitic skin disease is sweeping the areas that are held by the ISIS terrorists because they've kidnapped or forced out all the doctors in those areas who could have treated the disease. So that brings us today to the types of biting and blood-sucking flies that were available in the plagues and the enigmatic statement of Moses concerning what in the world was the abomination of the Egyptians that the Egyptians would have stoned the Hebrews for, for having made those sacrifices. It helps us now to narrow down the specific types of flies to these biting and blood-sucking flies that may have made up the swarms in Egypt. And remember, it's diverse kinds of flies, so there were multiple different kinds of these flies that were doing that. 
Although there are over, as we mentioned before, 240,000 different kinds of flies in the world, now here, this will, this will comfort you. There are only 4,500 different kinds of biting and blood-sucking flies. <laughs> Isn't that reduction in numbers of comfort that gives you the warm fuzzies? All the biting and blood-sucking flies fall into the family of Tabinidae, T-A-B-I-N-I-D-A-E. In the United States, we primarily know them as horse flies, but there are many different types, and they're called by different names in other parts of the world. Breeze flies, clegs or clags, deer flies, gad flies, zims, bulldog flies, and stouts. I just have to read you this little short part of a paragraph uh, out of the encyclopedia on these nasty creatures. The tabinidae are true flies and members of the insect order Diptera. Species of tabinidae that habitually attack humans and livestock are regarded as pests because the bites that females of most species inflict and the diseases and parasites that some species transmit. The various species of tabinidae range from medium size to very large in size. Some of them are as big as your thumb. Some species, such as deer flies and Australian march flies, are known for being extremely noisy in flight, although plagues, for example, fly quietly and bite with little warning. Tabinids are extremely fast and agile flyers. They have been observed to perform aerial maneuvers otherwise performed only by jet fighter pilots, such as the Immelmann Turn. The tabinids occur worldwide, being absent only on some remote oceanic islands and at extreme northern and southern latitudes. In other words, when God made these things, he was teaching us a lesson. You can't get away from them. Neither could the Egyptians. You're not fast enough, and you don't live at the North Pole or the South Pole. <clears throat> if God wants them to get you, they will get you, and he has more than enough to make life very painful. We'll see just in a moment how painful that can be. Now let me give you another piece of information that I hinted at a moment ago that shows how the sovereign God plans things in advance down to the smallest detail. <clears throat> Remember, the, the liberals want you to believe that because there were dead frogs and dead fish all over the land of Egypt, that that was the way in which the flies laid their eggs on these dead, decaying piles and heaps of frogs and fish, uh, and then they reproduced, sort of like a, a modern American housefly. Just a couple of days takes to do that. But you know, the tabinid species will develop as larvae for one to two years not a couple of days, one to two years. Obviously, God was sovereignly in control of what was going on here. It wasn't a naturalistic result. And by the way, that's the way evolutionists always try to explain things, as a naturalistic result. They see the same set of evidence, but they deny the word of God because they don't want to believe. They harden their hearts. They, they reject God so that they can follow their own ways, just like Pharaoh. Well, here's a good illustration of that. These are not the American house flies, which develop very rapidly, or some kind of moths that you see them lay their eggs, and a few days later these silly things pop out. It takes one to two years, but they only live a few days as adults. But these flies came precisely on schedule. Who God who predestines all things, even the hairs of our head, it was on the schedule that God had planned. God predestined every one of those Billions and billions of flies to show up on a single day to teach Pharaoh a lesson. He said, this is the reason I'm doing this. I'm teaching you a lesson. And to make sure you understand the lesson, not one of those flies, of those billions and billions, not one of them is going to go into the land of Goshen. Now, we're not told if God directly created the flies, as we are told with the lice, that God directly created. It's possible that this is another example, we can't prove it one way or the other, of fiat ex nihilo, that is creation out of nothing creation. But if it wasn't creation taking place at this point, it was certainly a miracle of volume and timing. These multiplied billions of biting flies had been gestating as larvae for one or two years. But they all metamorphosized into adult flies on precisely the same day and the same time. Now, people, that's a powerful, sovereign 
predestinating, electing God who can do something like that. You can't get around it any other way. When you know anything about the biting flies, that's something that only God could have orchestrated. It didn't happen by accident. Certainly not in series with all the other plagues that went on there in Egypt. Let's talk about pain for a minute. Tabinid bites are extremely painful, especially the bites of the very large varieties. Most of the short-tongued species, some have long tongues and actually pollinate flowers, but most of the short-tongued species use their knife-like mandibles to rip and or slice flesh apart. Doesn't sound very nice, but that's the way the, that the uh, encyclopedia describes them. Knife-like mandibles that rip and slice flesh apart. The bites of some of the most immediately painful in the insect world. And not only because of itching, but sometimes they cause a large swelling if they're not treated quickly. And you know, you can't keep these rascals away by swatting at them. They generally persist in attacking until they secure their quarry or are killed. Those are the only two options. Either it gets you or you get it. You can't just wave them away. They're not just a pest. Either it's going to get you or you're going to get it. There's no truce. You either have to kill them or be eaten alive. They also chase their intended target, even if it tries to run away. Nasty little creatures. I mentioned to some of you after the service last week, some of you have been to the shore and, and you've had sand flies, you know, get after you and you run away. And sometimes you can outrun them. The little sand flies that we have around here are not, not that fast. But, uh, you know, if you're having a hard time getting away, the thing to do, <laughs> I learned this years ago when I was a kid and couldn't outrun some of these things, hold your hand up in the air. This is all for free. This isn't part of the message. Just hold your hand up in the air because they always go for the top part of the body. They go for the head and they are stupid enough to think that your hand is your head. So it's better to get your hand covered with bites than it is to get your face covered with bites while you're running away. Just a practical lesson. Maybe, let me give you some illustrations. Maybe this will give you a better picture. Some of you are old enough to remember the Pacific theater of World War II. One of the most feared elements of the war were the Japanese kamikazes. A kamikaze was literally a flying bomb. The pilots were suicide bombers. They knew that they would never return from their one and only mission. The kamikaze was a giant bomb with wings attached to it. It had a limited amount of fuel, so it could not fly for very long or could not fly very far. These kamikazes were built so that they had no landing gear. No wheels where they could land on the ground. So the pilot could never land it without the kamikaze exploding. There was no ejection seat. The pilot was strapped into the cockpit with no parachute. The top of the cockpit was then bolted tight from the outside. They put that thing on and then they stuck bolts, screwed them in. So the pilot could never open it from the inside. He could never get out. When the Japanese pilot got into the cockpit, he knew he would never return to his ship. He would never return home. He would never again see his wife and children. He would die for the emperor whom he believed was a god, just like the Egyptians believed that Pharaoh was God. The kamikaze was then either catapulted from the deck of a Japanese carrier warship or dropped from the underside of a Japanese bomber near the American fleet. The kamikaze pilot's one job was to fly his bomb down the smokestack of one of the American ships into the bowels of the ship so that with one successful attempt, it would sink the entire ship and kill thousands of Americans with a single blow. If the kamikaze was not shot down, many Americans would lose their lives. Think of the flies that attacked Egypt like kamikazes. Some of you who are younger remember the Vietnam War. That war also had its suicide bombers. The Viet Cong would strike explosives to the bodies of little children and then send them running to the American troops. When they reached the troops, the Viet Cong would remotely detonate the devices, killing the child and killing any Americans within striking distance. This was also an emotionally devastating situation for the Americans as well. Because of our formerly Christian culture, the American men who were fathers of little children were paralyzed as to what to do as they saw those children running toward them. How could they kill a child? 
But if they didn't shoot that child before it reached the American lines, it would kill them and their men. You're all fully aware of the Muslim terrorists and the suicide bombers among them. You all remember 9-11 and the attack on the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and the aborted flight that crashed into a field near Shanksville, Pennsylvania. If you read the news or listen to all to the news, you are well aware of the Muslim women and children who have managed to carry body bombs through Israeli checkpoints and then self-detonate, killing Israeli soldiers. It's going on today, folks. These women and children are excitedly praised as heroes by the mindless and murderous masses of Muslims who hate Israel all over the world. Celebrations and parties and street parades are held in their honor. Children are specifically trained, and I have seen some of the videotapes of this, are specifically trained throughout the Muslim world to murder Christians and Jews. But for the Muslim man, it's even better. Muslim theology teaches that if a Muslim man murders Christians or Jews and dies in the process, it is an automatic ticket to the Muslim man cave heaven of sex, pleasure, palaces, silk sheeted beds, and virgins galore. And folks, they believe it. So they are happy to kill you to get into the target and then have entrance and introduction into the largest brothel in the universe. Folks, these are demon-possessed people. The devil has not changed his tactics. Satan is the author of death. Jesus is the author of life. God was powerfully demonstrating through the plague of flies what was the filthy and destructive gods of Egypt, what they were like. And that he had the power to bring them against their own worshipers and then to destroy them in one day by his word. Did you read that in the text? Verse 29, Moses said, Behold, I go out from thee, and I will entreat the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people tomorrow. But let not Pharaoh deal deceitfully any more in not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. And Moses went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord, and the Lord did according to the word of Moses. He removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh and his servants and from his people. Last phrase, there remained not one. A precise day, a precise time, the elimination of every one of them. There are a picture of the Lord of the Flies, of Beelzebub, of Satan himself. The way that he attacks and attacks and attacks and attacks and attacks. He goes after you, he goes after you, he goes after you. But God is able to control it. When it can come and when it can't come. God is able to control it when it will stop. He can get rid of every one of them. The very people that worship those flies were the ones that suffered as a result of those flies. And God is in control. Look at the supernatural involved here. Billions of flies appearing in a single day. Number two, that means that they all hatch on a single day even though they have different, different gestational periods. All those biting flies don't all have a two-year or a one-year gestational period. It moderates between one and two years. The length at each different type. Remember, there were different species. Diverse kinds of flies, it says in the text. They all gestate over a different period of time. But they all hatched in a single day. Not one of those flies flew to Goshen, that's number three, which was within walking distance of Pharaoh's palace. Moses is making daily trips back and forth. Number four, this plague personally affected Pharaoh. God said so. Flies got through to him as well as to everybody else. One well, of the reasons, I think, that he starts negotiations on plague number four. Number five, Moses was in the presence of Pharaoh, but not one fly bit Moses or Aaron. And they didn't even have, you know, off or deet or any of these sprays that you put on yourself when you go out fishing or hunting. At a precisely stated time, God removed the flies, every one of them. That's a miracle, folks. And number seven, it does not say that they just died like the frogs. It says God removed them. That's in the text there. Verse 31, and he removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh. So there remained not one. 
As I mentioned a moment ago, that's the first time the Pharaoh was willing to negotiate because it affected him in a very personal and painful manner. Many times, people who are stubbornly resistant against God are willing to negotiate when they are personally going through their bitter experiences of life. And you think, wow, this is wonderful. I see God is getting through to them. But as soon as the problem of life disappears, they immediately harden their hearts again and turn back to their old ways. That's just like Pharaoh. Don't be surprised if you've been witnessing to somebody, if you've been showing them about God, and suddenly they go through a difficult time. They've got cancer, or they've got heart problems, or they've got some horrible thing happening in their lives. They've just lost their job. That they seem to be receptive. But then when that problem is resolved, they turn their backs on God and go back to their old ways. That's just like Pharaoh. When the problems disappeared, Pharaoh, and notice it, God didn't do it this time without any help from God. It says Pharaoh hardened his own heart, verse 32, and Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also, neither would he let the people go. Other times it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Four out of the 11 times it says God, uh, Pharaoh hardened his own heart, and seven times it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Here's one of the times that Pharaoh very clearly, on his own, hardened his own heart. He is accountable. Now think about this for a second. That's stubborn, rebellious, recalcitrant, willful disobedience and refusal to submit to the revealed will of God. But as we look at it, don't be too quick to judge. Have you ever been in that position of being stubborn or rebellious or recalcitrant or in willful disobedience, refusing to submit to the authority and the revealed will of God? Have you ever been where you knew the will of God, you knew what the right thing was to do, but you set your jaw and stubbornly decided that you would do something else? So Pharaoh did. If you've been there, done that, you are Pharaoh. And you will be judged just like Pharaoh if you don't repent. But there's even more. Biting flies are known vectors for blood-borne diseases in both animals and humans. That brings us back to the issue of blood, by the way, which is where we began. That first plague was the plague of blood. God has a lot to say about blood throughout the plagues here. Biting and sucking flies carry what's called the equine infectious anemia virus. That's a virus that attacks horses. A rather serious problem for Pharaoh, who counted on his chariots and horses to maintain his military superiority. Later, in the days of King Solomon, Solomon maintained a balance of trade between the Hittites, those are the guys that lived in central Turkey, who made chariots of iron. The Hittites were the very first ones in history to learn how to smelt iron. And so they made chariots of iron, and then the Egyptians didn't have any iron that they could smelt, but they could breed horses. So they needed iron chariots, and the, up there in Turkey, they needed horses. And so there was this trade going on. And the only way to make that trade work was they had to come through what's called the Levant, that is, the nation of Israel, to get from central Turkey all the way down to Egypt. So Solomon was able to control the balance of trade between the Hittites who made the chariots of iron and the Egyptians who bred and sold the horses. To do business in Egypt, uh, to do business with Egypt and the Hittites, they had to pass through Israel to reach each other. So Solomon was able to control not just trade, but the balance of power, so that neither enemy could accumulate enough weapons of mass destruction, if you will, to harm him. Does that have any application for us today as we see what's going on in Iran and Iraq and what's going on with our president and other things? I think it does. Some types of tabernite flower flies also transmit the parasitic filarial worm Loa Loa between humans. They can bite one human and then they go on another human and they've just transmitted that disease. Now get this. Here's one that I know you've heard about because there have been envelopes sent through the mail with this stuff. Biting and blood-sucking flies are also known to transmit anthrax among cattle and sheep. You know, several years ago, there were various people getting envelopes in the mail full of white powder. And some of them were anthrax and some of them were just hoaxes. But places had to close down and special teams come in to make sure that it wasn't anthrax. 
these flies can transmit that as well. Are you beginning to see why Pharaoh was almost ready to give Moses everything he wanted? These flies could have completely wiped out Pharaoh's livestock. <laughs> However, God planned to use another plague to do that, and we're going to see that in future messages. God was going to wipe out the livestock, but he, he wasn't going to use the flies to do it. Tabinids also transmit tularemia, which is a disease that comes from rabbits, and the fly would bite the rabbit, bite the human, and suddenly you've got the disease. You think that's scary? No, not, not, not quite scary enough yet. Now it gets scary. This is perhaps one of the reasons that Pharaoh actually began to negotiate with Moses. Thought it was a bit scary before, listen to this. How much blood could these little liquid vacuum pumps suck out and chew out of their host? Blood loss is a common and dangerous problem in animals when large flies are abundant. Some animals have been known to lose up to 300 milliliters of blood in a single day to tabinid flies, a loss that can weaken or even kill them. There are reports of horsefly bites leading to fatal anaphylaxis in humans, although currently that is extremely rare, but wait until the Great Tribulation period. I don't think we're going to get to the book of Revelation today. I know we're not because we're already a quarter past and I haven't even begun to look at the passages that we have in the other parts of the Old Testament. Now, last week, somebody asked me, is it possible that these were bees and not flies? I don't think so, because the word for bees is a completely different Hebrew word, devorah. Uh, we would say Deborah in English. That's where the name Deborah comes from. It's a word that comes from a root meaning to be diligently systematic, which is what bees are. Bees are also beneficial. Horseflies, mosquitoes, and other biting and blood-sucking insects are not. Now, bees will attack you if they are disturbed, but like I mentioned a minute ago, the uh, tabinid order of biters and blood-suckers have made their purpose in life to attack and devour. The Bible distinguishes them from flies in one passage where it says that someday God will also use bees as a form of judgment. Now, this is out of Isaiah chapter 7, and all of you know Isaiah 7:14 because that's a very important messianic passage. Let me just read you in context. Moreover, the Lord spake again, this is Isaiah 7, beginning in verse 10. Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God, ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, being very pompous and pious, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary God also? God told you to do it, so do it. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Now, this is the verse you know. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. You say, wow, that's a Christmas passage. Yeah, right. Listen to what else is in the Christmas passage. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. The Lord shall bring upon thee and upon thy people and upon thy father's house days that have not come from the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, even the king of Assyria. Verse 18. Now here we see the distinction between flies and bees. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall hiss for the fly that is in the uttermost parts of Egypt. It's like you're getting somebody's attention. You, go, tss, tss, you know, tss, hiss. He shall hiss for the fly that is in the uttermost parts of the rivers of Egypt. And for the bee that is in the land of Assyria, bees aren't identified with Egypt, but the flies are. Bees are identified with Assyria. And they shall come and shall rest all of them in the desolate valleys and in the holes of the rocks and upon all thorns and upon all bushes. In the same day shall the Lord shave with a razor that is hired, namely by them beyond the river, by the king of Assyria. God's going to use the king of Assyria to shave Israel. The head and the hair of the feet, he shall also consume the beard. He's speaking about a judgment that's about to come on the nation of Israel. Isaiah prophesied about 750 B.C. In 722 B.C., Sennacherib, king of Assyria, descended upon Israel. If you remember your history, and I hope you do, that was the Assyrian captivity. And Sennacherib conquered the ten northern tribes. Remember, Israel was divided in half at this point. Ten tribes rejected the Davidic throne because of Rehoboam, the stupid grandson of, Sol of uh, uh, David, 
And they said, we're not going to have any more to do with this. To your tents, O Israel. And that left only two tribes left, Judah and Benjamin. Judah and Benjamin stayed with the Davidic throne. We get down now to the days of Hezekiah. The Syrians have come in. They've conquered the ten northern tribes. The Assyrians surrounded the city of Jerusalem. Hezekiah was like... Sennacherib says on one of his cylinders that he inscribed all of his war stories on, you know, Hezekiah was shut up like a bird in his cage. But Isaiah the prophet was still alive. He was still there. And Hezekiah spread out the scroll before God when Rav Shaka, who was the Assyrian general in charge of it, attacking the city of Jerusalem. They'd already conquered Lachish and several other of the, the fortified cities in Israel. He spread out the scroll that was said, he said, look, God, they, they haven't cursed us. They've cursed you. They've said that you're no better than the gods that, of all the nations that they have, have already conquered. Look, they've blasphemed your name. What are you going to do about it? And God sent Isaiah the prophet. And he said, you tell Hezekiah, they're not going to throw up a bulwark against the city. They're not going to shoot an arrow into the city. They're not going to burn anything with fire. They're not going to break down the gates of the city. They're not going to come into the city. By the same way that they came, by that same way, they're going to go back home. And it says that that night, the angel of the Lord went through the camp of the Assyrians and killed 186,000 of them. And Sennacherib heard a rumor in his own country that there was some problem going on. And so he turned around and he went back and as he got back to Assyria, he was in front of the God that he thought was the greatest God of all. The God who had conquered all of those other pagan gods. He was busy worshipping at the foot of the idol of that God, Nisroch. And while he was in the temple worshipping his own sons, two of them came and killed him. Is there a God who's in control? There certainly is. Well, this is a prophecy here. In the middle of it, that messianic passage, it's a prophecy of what was about to happen in the land of Israel when Assyria came in. But verse 18 clearly is a reference back to the plague of flies in Egypt and sets them apart from the bees, which are compared to the Assyrians who are about to invade the land and conquer the northern ten tribes. That brings us to some of the other passages in the Bible. I wish we could get to Psalm 78. We don't have enough time. Psalm 78 has a fantastic description of all the plagues of Egypt. Now, this wasn't just one thing that was recorded by Moses. We find it recorded in multiple books of the Old Testament. And it tells us something else about these flies. And it tells us why God used the flies to bring judgment. And it also tells us how God would use the flies to warn Israel. But we'll have to save that for next week. We'll have a part three. Gracious Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for your word and for its power. There's so many exciting things as we read it, as we study it, as we pay attention to it, instead of the stupid glib readings that we give in our so-called devotions, where we sort of skip our way through and can't remember what we've read, where we read one or two verses and think we're good for the day. We've had enough of your word for the time being. Father, help us to know that it's deep, it's rich, it's powerful. You use the things in there to teach us not just about what happened to Israel 1400 B.C., but you're teaching us about our own world today, about what's going on. What's going on in some of the wars in time past? What's going on in some of the wars right now? You're teaching us about some things that will happen in the book of Revelation. Judgment to come. How we need to warn those who are around us that judgment is coming. Father, thank you for your word. It's powerful. I pray, Father, that you'll transform my life by it. And that you'll transform the lives of this, your people. So we don't just lethargically and apathetically muddle through life. But we become zealous for Christ. Thank you, Father. Open our hearts to your word. Apply it. And make us obedient. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is number 305, Jesus Paid It All, we'll stand to sing hymn number 305.